All right, welcome. We are in junior English, and you should right now be on page 112. You ought to have your Ann Bradstreet annotations out. Again, if you don't have annotations, if you have not yet read this material, then you want to just have out a blank sheet of paper, and we'll be working with annotations now for the remainder of our session. I'm going to make some opening observations as we get ready now for the next exam that's coming. One or two of us took the last exam and realized uh, I need to get a little more serious about my exam prep. There were way too many questions on that last exam. I was not ready to answer. A big part of success on those exams is how well you're doing these annotations, correct? So we want to do a better job maybe of prepping for ourselves on those exams. I want to begin by first of all reminding you of a few things we've said before. You're going to need to put these in your notes. The society, the society that we will be now studying for several weeks in American thought is a society that we will label the Puritan Society. Let's write that down in our notes. The Puritan Society. Now I'm taking pre-class notes, which means I'm working in what color ink? Blue, blue or black. You got it. I'm taking in class notes. I'm working with blue or black ink. Kashima. All right? Who's correcting you? Now, when we use the term Puritan, let's go to work. I really need your focus here for 15 minutes, all right? Stay with me for 15 minutes. When we use the term Puritan, we are talking about a very special group of people in American thought. First of all, let's point out, we mean a group that are <coughs> predominantly religious in the way they define their life. That's what the word Puritan is going to derive from. A simple way to think about it is they are pure, this is where our word Puritan can sometimes be considered its etymology, they are pure in thought and in deed. In deed here simply means in act, okay, the way they behave. But now I want to define this notion of Puritanism in its political instantiation, the way we think about it politically, all right? Puritans are the first, the early Americans, who are living in survivor mode. Okay? Like we've said before, there are no Walmarts when these people show up. There ain't no Blairs or John's IGA when these people show up. Everything they need, there's no Holiday Inn when these guys show up. Everything they need, and underline the word everything, I do mean everything. Everything that they need for their survival, they have got to generate on their own account. You can't bring enough water from England. You can't bring enough wood. You can't bring enough in just whatever it is you want to fill in, food, whatever. All of it must come from the land, which is why in the early years, this group of people struggled to stay alive. Many, many of them died. Some of them died for lack of food. Believe it or not, some, some of them just starved to death. They got no, they didn't have enough to eat. Some of them died from lack of water, drinkable water. Many of them died from disease and sickness. A lot of them freeze to death. They show up this time of year. And all of a sudden, you know, it's not that cold, right? But, you know, here in a few more weeks... As the weather starts to turn, if you don't have a way to, to heat yourself and stay warm, you just freeze to death, right? So it's all, that's all part of the survivor. Now, why didn't they head over during the winter season so by the time they got here it would be early spring? A lot of that has to do with the safety of, tr of crossing the Atlantic. There are certain times of the year when the Atlantic Ocean is a very dangerous body of water to travel across. It's an excellent question. Of course, some did, right? We're talking about growing numbers of people. Secondly, these, this group of people define themselves as a theocracy. Theocracy. Theo of or relating to God. 
In other words, these people make no separation between church and state. None. The ones who have the power are the chief leaders of the church. Okay. And they will see very clearly the, the hierarchy as that pyramid we put on the board before. Men are in charge. It is definitely a patriarchy. Men run the world. Women are told what to do, and they do it, or they get jacked. The easiest way to kind of keep, then, the women in check is to threaten them if they step out of line or challenge male authority by calling them a witch. These Puritans believe in the actual possession of the devil within human beings. They really believe in that stuff, okay? So they genuinely believe that witches have this capacity to do nasties in regards to the devil, okay? Now, think about this for a second, though. If you are a woman and some guy tells you to do something and you don't want to do it and you say, no, I ain't doing that, one thing that can be done, then, is to call this individual, this woman, a witch. She can be put on trial, and if she's found guilty, soap on her own. Got me? You just jack her. But think about how that works for the other women who maybe are thinking about stepping up and saying they don't want to do it. Right. They get to watch what happens to the other girl. And then they go, you know what? I think I was before going to say something about how I don't like this. I'm not going to say that anymore. All of a sudden, it's at that point, we start to recognize <clears throat> the issues of power and control. That you want to write down in your notes. The issues of power and control. The Puritans, we can easily judge this group of people as being, you know, intolerant, not very <laughs> nice, whatever language you want to use. But we got to remember... This is a group of people who are in survivor mode, and that means, for your, oh, for your notes, forced unity. What is unity? Is everybody doing this fighting or no? Everyone's what? Everyone's getting along, right? If you are in survivor mode, everyone has to be in harmony. The way that's decided is simple. You're going to tell everybody what to do, and they're going to do it. If they don't do it, they're going to get jacked. In the early years, it's really this simple. In the early years, this is the way control happens. Now, what we are about to do, and I'm going to have you jot this down in your notes. What we are about to do is to take a look at several texts. First, we're going to look at some poems written by a woman named Anne Bradstreet. We're going to focus on the poem on 112 called To My Dear and Loving Husband. <coughs> we're going to read this poem from two different perspectives. And we're going to ask, is there a political reading of this poem as well as a romantic reading of this poem? I think there is. Then, secondly, we're going to take a look tomorrow and days to follow at a sermon that became the most popular sermon during this time. The name of that sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. When we look at that sermon, some of us will say, jeez, this is pretty intense stuff. I will say about that sermon, it was the most popular sermon of its day. It was preached and read from pulpits all over the eastern seaboard. Right? Now, wait a minute. I said pulpits. What's a pulpit? Right? That's one of these things in front of a church. But what if you didn't want to go to church? You woke up, for example, on Sunday morning and said, church sucks, I ain't going. Way wrong answer. Toast on a post, soap on a rope. You get jacked really quickly. Well, but think about it. If you're in, if you're in survivor mode and you need everybody to be harmonious and together, you can't have people going, yeah, I don't think I'm doing that project. Right? You can't allow for non-conformity. You can't allow for the dissenting voice. Everyone has to be on the same page. Everyone's got to be friends and get along. If you don't want to be friends and get along, you will get jacked. 
Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God is John Edwards' sermon that basically tries to control everyone through, write it in your notes, fear. Fear. We're going to talk about that one. Finally, we're going to look at a text called The Crucible. Now, it's important you understand, this play was not written in 1600. We're talking about a time of that time period, but not written during that time. This play was actually written in the 1950s by a guy named Arthur Miller. In other words, a hundred years, a little over a hundred years, uh, I'm sorry, uh, um, what, 50 years before you were born, basically, right? This, this play gets written and performed. It becomes one of the most famous plays in American history. However, Miller tells the story of the Salem, that's the name of a town, of the Salem Witch Trials. So we'll be reading a play that sat during the Puritan time. We study the play to learn more about Puritans and the way they worked with this notion of forced harmony or forced unity. Okay? Where did he get his... Miller did homework to learn the history of this time period. He read a lot of court cases, right, from this time period because it's about witch trials. The witches were brought in front of judges. And they had to defend the accusation that they were a witch, right? They had to try and combat it or whatever, okay? Now, I want to go to page 112 real quickly, and we're going to spend some time with Ann Bradstreet. We're going to look at this poem, and we're going to try to have two readings of it. So for your notes real quickly, we're going to be looking at two readings of this poem, okay? Two readings of this poem. The first reading, Yesenia, we can say it this way for your notes. The first reading is what we will call a romantic reading of the poem. I mean, you can obviously look at the title, right? Are you with me on page 112? To my dear and loving husband, right? Okay. So we're going to see this first from a romantic perspective. Then, Mr. McCreary, we're going to look at this poem a second time. The second time, we're going to ask a political reading of the poem. A political reading of the poem. You're going to want to write it down as that. What do I mean by political? We'll define it when we get there. Who's one? Level one stuff? Yeah, we're still working level one, wood two, a. Okay. All right, let's take a look at the poem itself. To my dear and loving husband, Anne Bradstreet. This is a woman, a wife, <coughs> writing a poem to her husband where she has things she wants to say to him. Take a look at what she says to him. If ever... Two were one, then surely we. If ever man were loved by wife, then thee. If ever wife was happy in a man, compare with me, ye women, if ye can. I prize thy love more than whole mines of gold, or all the riches that the east doth hold. My love is such that rivers cannot quench, nor aught but love from thee give recompense. Thy love is such I can no way repay. The heavens reward thee manifold, I pray. Then while we live, in love let so persever, that when we live no more, we may live ever. And you're supposed to go at the end of that reading, aww, like that, aww, right? Okay, because we're going to look at this poem, first of all, as a love poem. Now, let's make some quick, it gets dark at night, kind of obvious things about this poem. Uh, you have a woman who is a wife writing to her husband. And look at the opening lines, look at what she says. If ever... Two were one, then surely we, if ever man were loved by wife, then thee. Put in your own words at level one. What has she just said? First two lines of the poem. What has she just said to her guy? If two were supposed to be together. Yeah, if two people are ever supposed to be together, it's us. In other words, what she's saying. Put it in your own words. She, does she really love her guy? Yeah, she really loves her guy. Keep reading. Notice, if ever wife was happy in a man. Uh-oh, what's she say? I'm totally, totally happy being married just to you, right? Compare with me, you women, if you can. She says what to all the other women who would maybe read this poem? I got the best, I got the best guy. You guys are all way jealous because I got the best guy. Then she goes on to talk about her guy. Look at it. I prize thy love more than whole mines of gold or all the riches that these doth hold. You could offer me $10 million, and I still would take you over $10 million. On and on. You're the most amazing guy in the whole wide, right? On and on it goes. Do you think it's true? 3B question. Do you think it's true this is what guys at World in High School want to hear from their girl? No. 
You're the best. You're the best I've ever known. You're the most stunningly handsome. You're the most remarkably nice guy. You are. You are the. You are the best guy any girl could ever want. Do you think guys want to hear that? Do you think in the end this is what guys want to hear from their girls? It's interesting to me how, for years, I've been lecturing this poem. I ask this question. Almost never do guys answer this question. It always seems to me to be the girls. And the girls always go something like, no, that's not what they want at all. Which is really interesting because notice, I'm asking if this is what guys want. And the girls are the ones that speak up. Now, Mr. Hunter just made an interesting observation, though, under his breath. He said, yeah, maybe. <laughs> uh, I mean, if you're serious, maybe that's probably, you know, come to think of it, it's probably, I mean, how many guys at one high school want to hear from their would-be girlfriend? You know, of all the guys I've known, you probably are somewhere at a five or lower. <laughs> right? Right? Okay, right, right. Uh, as opposed to, of all the guys I've ever known, without a doubt, you're definitely the best. Which is probably what a guy wants to hear. Of course, the real question will be if the guy hears it and the girl says it, is it true? Let's go to a second reading of this poem. A political reading of this poem. Do you remember when we put that little pyramid on the board? Do you remember where we put men in comparison to women? Above them. Right. Men are above women, correct? Who runs the show in the family, the, the guy or the girl? The, guy. the husband. You got it. Now, I'm going to ask a question that I want you to jot this question down in your notes. Given that political dynamic of guys being above girls, why would a woman write a poem like this to her guy? Don't say it. Write down your answer. Why would a wife <coughs> write a poem to her guy where she says, you are the most amazing man in the whole wide world. Of all the husbands that I can have, you're the very best. And you are, her. say it again, say it out loud. She cheated on him? In what she regards would you, yeah, you know, keep going though. She's you're, 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 you're even way beyond my question, but it makes it even more interesting. Jeez, okay. What would be the political advantage a woman would have in saying to her guy, you are the best. Let's write down the word sarcasm. What's our literary word for sarcasm? It isn't sarcasm. You say one thing and you mean something else in rhetorical. literature. What do we call that? Rhetorical. It's some, to some degree rhetorical, but I, I have another word that makes this even more exact. What is it in literature when we say one thing but we mean something else? You're absolutely right, Mr. Mortimer. We call it irony. Absolutely right. What's the other word, Mr. Tashima? You're right. It's satire. Let's write both of those down. Irony, satire. You say one thing, but you mean something else, right? So, for example, you are out on a date and you're a girl and you come in to your girlfriends afterwards and they go, so how did it go? And you go, yeah, that was pretty much about the very best date I think I could ever have. But the girls all go, ooh, is that bad? See, that's irony. In other words, it's fairly clear. You're saying it was great, but what you were really saying was, it sucked. Okay? That's irony. That's satire, okay? I'm asking now, is there a possible satiric reading, ironic reading, to this poem? Let's point out, this poem initially was read as a romantic poem, a celebration of true love. Into the 20th century, feminist readers of this poem, however, started to look at this poem a second way. Wait a minute. What does Anne Bradstreet gain by telling her man... You're the most remarkable guy in the whole wide world. In what regards freedom? How does she get freedom by saying you're the you're the greatest? If she says to him, "You're the greatest of all time," he may not feel so net compelled to have to what control her, put a leash on her, was what Barr said. Some of us are going ah. So in other words, there's a way to say to him what he wants to hear so that he then can begin to feel he is in charge. The minute he feels he's in charge because she wrote the poem, who actually has the power? How does she have the power? She wrote the poem. 
An argument here is that Bradstreet is intentionally doing some political writing here. If you live in a, in a, pa in a, in a patriarchy, in a hierarchy, where the guy has all of the power and the girl <coughs> has none of the power, then it might be the case, well, you write it down in your notes. Tim McGee. Great. <laughs> sure, you bet. Uh, Ashley Herrera, they're looking for you in the front office for a minute or something. Think about this. If the girl is in a subjugated position, if the female is in a subjugated position, if the wife is in a sub subjugated position, and she wants to gain the upper hand, one way she could do it is to say, we are, we are not going to play this game anymore. I mean, I am done with you and this male thing. You get to tell me what to do all the time. I'm going to do everything I want. How's that going to go over? That's dangerous. Way dangerous. Why? What, he, what might he, if she continues to, if she continues to perpetuate this kind of thing, what might he accuse her of? Witch. Being a, you're a witch. Something's wrong with you. You clearly are trying to usurp, remember our little pyramid? You're trying to usurp or overthrow the will of God. Remember, that's how we put it at the top, right? God made it this way. I can accuse you of being a witch if you don't like hold everything, right? That's one way she could go. She could try and fight him that way. Another way she could do it is to say, do you know you're the very greatest man of all time? Now Mortimer starts laughing because he starts to realize there's a political use of this. This argument runs something like this. In the end, women are smarter than men. They're so, Barnard did like this. In the end, women, this is how smart women are. Women are so smart, they know how to control their men by using language. But... When the woman says to her guy, you are the greatest, that's a way to try to control him in some way. Do you think there are any girls at Roland High School that control their guys this way? Yes. No. <laughs> Surely guys are smarter than that. Oh! There's 